Hello and welcome to Music Works. Are you a string player with performance anxiety? Do you let negative thoughts creep in while practicing and do you dread concerts? Do you hold your breath while playing? Are you in pain? Would you love to play effortlessly and with an open heart? Today we are privileged to welcome Ruth Phillips, founder of the Breathing Bow and the Inside Out Musician. The Inside Out Musician is an online community committed to fostering musical creativity, collaboration and well-being, while the Breathing Bow is a holistic approach to string playing that uses breath, meditation and yoga-inspired techniques to ease anxiety and encourage being in the moment, both in the practice room and on stage. Stay with us for news about Ruth's upcoming publication on musicians' well-being, the course she will be launching in June with her collaborator Sophie Renshaw to meet this huge unmet need, as well as more information about both the Breathing Bow and the Inside Out Musician. And do you have an idea for the listeners challenge Ruth is going to throw out to you in this episode? More news at the end. But first, here's a message from our sponsor. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz offer a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment with protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. And, unlike home insurance, there's no excess to pay on instrument or accessory claims. At the moment, Allianz have a special online offer with two months free cover. Not only that, every Allianz Music policy now includes free legal assistance and support so you can protect yourself both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliansmusic.co.uk Allianz, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. And so now we'll go over to the Music Works studio to meet Ruth Phillips and hear what she has to share about well-being and how musicians deal with that aspect of their physical performance. Welcome Ruth, thank you so much for joining us on Music Works. It's lovely to be here. Um, this is Ruth Phillips, cellist, founder of The Breathing Bow and co-founder of Inside Out Musician. Um, and she has come here to talk about um, all of these things and in particular focus on well-being in music. Um, so I'm keen from our preliminary chat to get started because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so welcome Ruth, thank you so much again for coming and um, where would you like to start? What would you like to tell us about your, um, your organisations? Well the Breathing Bows I've been running for about 10 years now. Um, my interest in in this area came very much as I think so many musicians interest in well-being comes from injury or not well-being so I suffered from terrible stage fright and I had a frozen shoulder so that'll do it <laughs> that'll do you know making you go on a path to seek uh, to seek being basically the thing that interests me most is how do we become present how do we become present and how can we move with ease and grace as we mostly do through life but something gets a bit blocked often when we have an instrument and certainly when we get on stage and that became to something that fascinated me more and more and I worked with a wonderful yoga teacher Peter Blackaby in Brighton who I think it was this moment where suddenly I realized that movement actually happens on release. And it was this real aha moment for me because I think we, in our training, we learn so much about controlling everything. We learn to control every single microsecond of the music and every single, single micro movement. And what we don't learn, at least I certainly didn't, and I think it's rare to be taught this, it does happen, but I, I think the thing that actually learning to let go, learning to release, learning to allow the body to establish and stay with its natural wisdom and for the music to actually come through us, 
rather than us making it um, is a huge area. And it, I suppose it's kind of become my life's passion, really. So That's absolutely fascinating. So um, the breathing bow, um, then, is it, is it a coaching technique, a coaching um, program for string players? Yeah, I... I run, yeah, I work string players, um, and it's essentially what I do on the Inside Out Musician. I'm part of a team, an amazing team of incredible women on Inside Out Musician. Um, and I, I use the breath mostly because it, like the wave in nature, and everything in nature is curved, nothing is straight. Um, everything in music is curved, nothing is straight, and yet we, uh, we spend hours trying to uh, study how to have an incredibly straight bow. Why? So I, I suppose I, in my yoga practice, and then it led to an uh, interest in mindfulness. I'm now training to be a mindfulness teacher. Um, I became really interested in this idea that, that we're working against nature all the time when we practice, not all the time, but so often the movements that we're learning are going against nature. In fact, they're against music completely. Music is doesn't have any straight lines like a landscape. It's natural, and as as is our body. So, I suppose the breathing bow, the breath, really became my sort of my biggest teacher, and um, the shape of the breath, and the fact that through the breath we can learn to the spine moves with the breath, the rib cage moves with in the breath. There's sort of everything, you know. There's um, it's such a great teacher. It's a sort of endless subject, really. And I, I became sort of fascinated with it. And um, then I work a lot with how the breath and the bow connect up. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that's just that just been going on and on. <laughs> so yeah, I run retreats. I do online. I do online one to ones and now courses because of the pandemic. And I have people come, I live in the south of France, so I have people come for a uh, individual retreat where the, the timetable is completely up to them and we have a, a little house that we rent out. So they come often come with their family or with a partner and have a beautiful holiday in Provence and then, and then we work for between two and four hours a day. Um, and then I run courses with my friend, uh, the breathing bow courses with my friend Jane Fenton, who's a wonderful cellist and also a yoga teacher. And with an incredible chef, whole food chef, who's also a cellist and a yogi. So we, it's a, it's a mind blowingly well-being bonanza, fantastic time. But unfortunately they, the last year had to be canceled. So we're just hoping that it will happen again, maybe certainly next spring if not maybe in, in the autumn and as a singer do you have to be a string player to come on this retreat no you can come <laughs> yeah. <Katie>. i'll <laughs> give you a special somebody said it's the, the only course she's ever done where you can just turn up in your yoga pants and do a course <laughs> and drink fine wine and <laughs> No, it's oh, really, it really I mean, is very, just, very heavy. You know, it just sounds like everything, doesn't it? I've got really into yoga this year, actually. Really? It's been, Wonderful. Well, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's been interesting for me. I've never been good at mm. yoga and I'm still not, but actually it's been one of the few things that doing it online has really helped me because mm. I haven't had to go to a place where everyone is, you know, dressed in impeccable yoga clothes and knows how to do Absolutely. what they have to do with all of the straps yes. and things. So just doing it yes. in my son's bedroom on my, sort of on my own, but in a class online has actually suited me down to Yes, the actually, um, it's very interesting what you're saying, Katie, because I, I also have my, my yoga teacher in Brighton has started. So it's been 30 years that I've waited to go back to his class. I'm so gosh. excited and he's going to keep going online. And I agree with you. And I think that is one of the absolute um, gems of online learning is you can because a lot of what I'm doing is is becoming embodied basically I'm helping people actually feel things from that's why we call the inside out musician feel things really from the inside out and in our culture of Facebook and all of this everything is externally um, uh, orientated and I totally agree with you about the yoga class, and I think that that extends really to to music and performing and playing an instrument. I can, I don't know whether this is your experience, but I know that when I'm doing, I 
I really get the lycra thing, you know, no, I, I'm never going to look like that. And I'm never going to yeah, do exactly. a full event that far. And you do, you get into kind of comp competition and, and in ad feeling inadequate and, and all those feelings come up. And actually when you're in your own space, you can really be present in your own body as it is in this moment um, without judgment. And it's much, much more powerful. And that is actually, you know, I spoke to my yoga instructor about this and she said it is, it is absolutely, you know, that is exactly within the sort of um, ethos of yoga is that it's all about your body and your journey and your experience. And it's not mm. about comparisons or other people's bodies at all. However, it's just very difficult in, I think, the, the kind of modern Western life that we live in not to not to see it like that. And especially when, you know, you are... You, you are never going to bend as far as that person because you know you have boobs that are in the way or something like that you know it's just yeah. like which is basically what I'm dealing with and it's, <laughs> it's yeah. just much easier and like I say it's not um it's been something that I probably choose to keep doing on Zoom my also my my instructor is a friend of mine from university um who lives in in London and I live in Newcastle so you yeah. would never have been able to to study with yeah. you know face to face apart from very occasionally anyway um so again that that personality match is really important to me as well she has for me exactly the right balance of um really great training um but you know uh, it's we, interesting you know, we isn't it? understand each other as well you know yeah i mean um, it's interesting what you're talking about because we're talking about going now you know we talked about going into some kind of with the pandemic we all you could i mean the way i like to look at it is painful and as much suffering as there has been, and there really has been and is, um, there has been also another side to this, which is an invitation to go inwards. And that, it, that can be very painful. Um, and I think for us musicians, a lot of people have gone on quite an inward journey. Um, and I, I know quite a few people who have uh, learned things they would never have learned, taken the literally taken a breath, taken a pause, stopped running, stopped being competitive, had to. And mm. despite all the discomfort that has caused, and of course, financial loss, and let's not underestimate those that, that side of it. But I think it's always worth looking for the gold in the situation. And I think now it's gonna be quite interesting people coming into playing again, playing live again, what will people be able to carry forward that they have been able to listen to in themselves, you know? Just having had that period of just going inwards a little bit. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I do agree about that. Um, I also, I had an interesting conversation with a student on this podcast, a student who's a postgraduate student at Guildhall, um, vocal student, she was on my first series, and she said she'd finished her last year of undergraduate at Guildhall in summer 2020 so her basically her end of her undergraduate degree had been obviously enormously impacted by the pandemic and she said that her and her peers had been literally instrumental in you know in them surviving musically at least mental health wise at least because mm -hmm. and they'd they'd come together and they it, virtually but you know they'd practiced together they'd exchanged voice notes they'd they'd done things together in the way that peers I'm not saying it never happens, but it's not necessarily the norm. And especially in, in a potentially very competitive environment like Music College, she said that she felt that it was a far more understanding and collaborative space mm. than, it, than it would have been otherwise. And I was really, yeah. really heartened to hear that because I yeah. often feel that competition between musicians never does anybody any favours and causes yeah. a lot of anxiety and, and um, you know, unpleasant working. Certainly. And, and, uh, and, and in terms of what the, the community that, that has actually built up during this time, and I think partly because you touched on this in one of your podcasts, I think partly because there has been so much grief, real grief, that has in, all, in some way cracked people open you know, and it's a bit like the heartbreak. The heartbreak is very painful, but it opens our hearts in a way. And in, in a way, something like that has been going on, I think, on, amongst, in many areas. And there has been, we've just been, had to fall back on compassion for ourselves and for other people. We've just had, that, that's in a way all we've had left 
we've had to support each other in 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 the way people do like for example in the war you know people got together and they sang together they had to they had to to develop these communities and because we all we couldn't get together and sing together but we did that what you, the thing you're and i think that we've touched on something i really hope we don't lose it that we've we've understood how much a self compassion and b compassion for one another is important because we live in an extremely competitive world the music world it's riddled with competitive competition and judgment and i'm i'm really hoping that we will have found the importance of of this sense of mutual support and kindness actually that's a, a really big Thank hope you. that i have as well um and one of the things that i've found since the pandemic most generally amongst musicians and everyone is that it's the first time ever that i've experienced there being a general understanding that probably everyone or mostly everyone you meet is not going to be in a great state of mental health mm. um which is i mean in my experience was probably actually always true to a certain extent but this said but but less way less acknowledged mm. um and that this this communal um grief and trauma that we've all been through um has hopefully made us more understanding of each other and less assuming that the default is that you know everyone's very fine you know yes um, absolutely <laughs> absolutely and going going back will be very interesting going back how kind can we be to one another how can we um re-enter this profession re with with um i think it's very true that there has been a tremendous amount of unspoken suffering in this profession in certainly in uh, in student within the student bodies mm. of stage fright of um feeling unworthy um and inadequate I, I don't know many people who who if you got them talking about their training wouldn't say that that they suffered from that um performance anxiety um mm. but nobody spoke about it until fairly recently actually yeah and i think yeah. now people are talking about it and i think now a lot of people will be feeling it actually people who hadn't felt it before yeah, well, also, we feel things more when we haven't done them for a while, don't we? Mm. Because I've, I've been noticing, so a friend, uh, well, one of my colleagues we, with my company um, went and um, oversaw a, um, a BBC recording last a couple of weeks ago, or probably about a month ago now, actually, and um, she was exhausted after it. She was like, I had to get the tube, you know, <laughs> I had to go, you know. Um, and then she'd spent the whole, uh, you know, like a, a sort of afternoon and evening doing this thing. And, you know, it was great. It was wonderful, but it was exhausting. And then I know that I found that since things have opened up a bit more, I've been able to see friends in sort of public places more easily. I've been more exhausted as well just from doing that. And actually, I think we've found we may be feeling more how exhausting life was before, um, mm. which we never noticed until we stopped doing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm very excited about things opening up more and the fact that it's now, um, well, this will be going out after this happens. On the day that we're recording this, it's just under a week in the UK until um, we can go inside with other people again. <laughs> Mm. and uh, lots of headlines saying that hugging is going to be legal from <laughs> from next <laughs> oh gosh what Monday. is that what is a I'm hug fairly sure that hugs <laughs> were never illegal i hope that they weren't but but yeah certainly discouraged and um, you know yeah. it's uh, yeah. it's a nice thing to think of but it definitely comes with there's some understanding to be found there i think about um how tiring it is to drastically shift Mm. Well, we're not used to giving us we're not used to giving ourselves self-care actually no. and i think a lot of us look to our teachers and our colleagues and whoever to to care for us and our in the profession and i think we've we've had to fall back on self-care and that we've probably all learned quite a lot about it and what we are what our limits are mm. and what we need to feel nourished and healthy Absolutely. And I remember going back to discovering a need for self-care when my son was smaller than he is now. He's still quite small. And before then, I just never valued it at all. I mean, obviously, I'd enjoyed it if it had happened, but I'd never prioritised it. I'd never said to myself, I need this to nourish myself and to 
um, to be better at everything that I'm doing. It was always a bonus mm. if it happened. Mm. It was only a, reaching that kind of, you know, not having slept for two years point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you and realise you just have to do these things. You, know? you can see it in a kind of micro way when, when, funnily enough, I was just remembering the other day, I went to a, I went to a, a concert, I won't say who it was, a very famous cellist who I actually really admire. Um, not the other day, of course. <laughs> the other year yeah, <laughs> and and he kind of well. ran on stage and plopped him plopped his bum down on the chair and started to play and it was very interesting experience because I could feel in my body I could actually feel resentful I could feel that I hadn't been invited in he in a way and I don't mean this as a criticism of him because we all I think to a certain extent we all do this I, it was an example because he was so well known and I was so shocked. In a way, there was a sense that he didn't invite himself in before he started to play. It was like, bah, bah, bam, you know, it was a real wham, bam, thank you, ma'am moment, you know. And yeah. it was very interesting because there wasn't that pause to go inwards, to listen inwards. What my teacher once said to me, something inside you has to move before you are moved to play and that process takes time it takes a pause it doesn't actually take very much time it can be just a second but it's not time that we take is it we don't take the time to go inwards where how what do i want to express where do i feel it allowing the gesture to come out organically from inside of us and I really believe that if we do that, we not only invite ourselves along the journey and the music, but we also invite our audience. And I'm absolutely convinced that an audience feels that. That if, if we've taken the time to connect with ourselves, really done that, that's also an invitation for them to come. Have you ever had that experience where you feel you're not quite ready for, for, for the music when it starts you haven't been prepared you haven't been invited or i have and i also it reminds me of an interesting conversation i once had in a singing master class or, or kind of it wasn't a master class it's an intensive week-long training course that i was taking part in and um as part of vocal technique there's there's always a lot of you know making sure that you're making the best possible use of the breath and not not needing to breathe too often because you're not managing your breath properly um, and there was an interesting discussion once that I heard about not making that go so far as to make the audience uncomfortable by feeling like you were never going to breathe. And it might be that you know that you can do it, but actually, first of all, they might not know and it might feel uncomfortable, but also mm. the music needs breath. The music needs, but you may not need to take a phys physical breath, but you do need to pause and, you know change sentence or, yeah you know, whatever so yeah know, that as well. I think that's very good. that's yes I also I talk a lot about that when I work a lot on myself when you know I was talking about the the parts of our playing that that uh we don't learn to let go and in fact what we don't learn to do is breathe out and if our audience um, literally breathing out means releasing air it means it means letting go of what we've taken in. And the way we learn, I think, to play is, is just taking in and taking in. And, and then we have to somehow project it outwards, you know. But we, we haven't, we don't, it, there's an act of generosity in a way. There's a, there's a, a in, in really letting go and in exhaling, if you like. And if we are doing that, if we are literally letting go and not controlling the music all the time, then I, and, and it, we have that relationship between um, taking in and letting go, which is a natural, we're going back to the subject of the breath, but it is a natural relationship, which is what sort of life is based on, and it has to be in balance. If we've got that in relationship in our playing and in our bodies, then, I'm, then the person sitting in the audience can breathe with us. If we, if we haven't, I think the tendency will be to be impressed or anything else but really being with us and breathing with us as another human being in the moment I think can only happen if we are following those same shapes and really letting go does that make sense to you it does make sense yeah I agree um 
So you mentioned, um, so the breathing bow obviously involves dealing with things like stage fright and um, other, other problems that, that musicians often face. What um, stage of career do people often come to you at? Is it literally any stage? Do you get a lot of students, yeah. post-students? Very, very mixed bag. And um, I love, love working with mixed groups. I love working with groups of, I had the other day a 12 year old, brilliant cellist. I mean, just not play the socks off me completely. <laughs> and um, uh, 70, two 70 or 80 year old amateur cellists and teachers. And I think in the end, we all have, we all have a body, right? We all have a heart. We all have a spirit. We all have a desire to communicate. And we're all curious about the way things work. And I found that in these mixed groups that, that quite often, you know, the word amateur comes from the word love. And there's a direct, often amateurs bring such a direct connection with music with their love of music. And there's a open hearted curiosity that quite often either professional musicians or, or very hardworking students, we've lost track of that. And it's so wonderful to remember it. It's such a, I think that people have been surprised in these mixed groups of how much everybody brings and reminds us of our shared, our shared um, humanity really. And that's a lovely thing to remember. Um, mm, absolutely. It's wonderful. The, um, it's interesting. If I'm going to do music for, in, for, for pure enjoyment, I don't sing, which is my, my instrument. I play the piano, which is something that I have never and will never do in front of an audience because I can't get through a single piece mm. of music without making glaring mistakes. But it's this sort of <laughs> self-developmental, slightly hypnotic... Um, process that I go through on my own to kind of decompress and uh, and yeah. do music in a completely different way with no pressure whereas singing practice is practice you know you have to know things you have to get better you have to improve issues obviously that's yeah and in that well, in that in case it's very unlikely <laughs> but in in that we all we we tend we can we can lose sight of our I love this expression um, going to the edge and going to the edge and softening. We can lose sight of that, taking, taking risks, really pushing, really, really going to the edge because we have to be perfect. I mean, the, the, we have been told that we, we're not allowed to make mistakes. And of course, we know in our, we know in life that all our learning has come from mistake. All our best learning has probably come, come from what we call a mistake, right? And in, I'm sure we all would agree that a, a live performance that really touches us is not a perfect performance. It's one where somebody's voice cracks because of the emotion. They're on the edge. They're just on the edge of that. They're willing to go over that edge and they're also willing to soften into it. And if we don't practice going to the edge and past it, so that's why, you know, the, the, when we do things that we haven't got that whole bag of perfectionist and judgmental messages with on our back, which is a very heavy bag, we can find another level of joy, I think. But I really think we can find, we can, we can change the messages in that, that we give to ourselves on, um, in our professional music making too, you know. I'm continually... Um enormously impressed and also quite bewildered by what musicians professional musicians manage to achieve in terms of um enormous feats of incredible beautiful art making whilst dealing with such a background of expectation competition um other people's opinions essentially which obviously are essential but mm -hmm. they they can be very much um placed as gospel can't they um i of, i'm often i'm just bewildered as to how so many incredible professionals exist who can create such fantastic and unique music with this sort of mm. weight like you mentioned this weight um behind them 
Yeah, I think when you when you say that, I'm thinking about all the musicians that don't exist because they crumbled under yes, the weight. Absolutely. Um, and I think that it has been very, um, very. There's some very damaging psychology around. Has been, um, and I think we're coming out of that now. I think there's much, much more awareness about how teachers talk to students and and the language that we use. To me, not nearly enough. I mean, I watched a masterclass the other day, and I was really shocked at the the level of judgment and I would say cruelty, actually. And so, who gets who? I mean, it is our right. It is every human being's right to make music. And who has been, on some level, either told they never can, or they don't, they shouldn't, or who has taken it so far but just crumbled under weight, the weight of all that judgment, and as well the the, the physical aspect, the strain that we. We're beginning again to deal with much more now, but we. I think if I think about how I was taught, and again, you know, this is a generational thing. This is not. I'm not, you know, accusing anybody, <laughs> so, um, because I think there was there was a generation of teachers who taught in this way. That's how they were. That's how they were taught, and it's like parenting, really. You're a parent. I'm a parent. Uh, we're all doing our best. Um, but I think about, I was taught to play with my head and my hands, basically. Nobody ever mentioned anything in between. And I was taught that it was right or it was wrong or it was good or it was bad. And that, I mean, that, that's a very simplified version of the, what can be very subtle in, in even, I'll give you an example of just a, a more subtle example of how when we're practicing, for example, if I'm practicing something and I play something out of tune, I'm going to go, my habit will be to say, oh, that was out of tune. And even if I don't say it in a nasty way, if we think about that statement, it's still a judgment. There's no information in it, is there? There's no, it was sharp or it was flat. Mm. So it basically just is a judgment. And then because there's no information, I don't know what to do about it. Right. I don't know whether to send my arm a little further or to not send it quite so far. So in a very subtle way, just with that one statement, which we all say all the time to each other and to ourselves, I'm, I'm not only not doing myself any good, but I would say that there's, a, there's damage done in that judgment because it's gonna, it's gonna influence my sense of self, my sense of my confidence, my, it, but it certainly isn't teaching me anything. So the way, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's a big subject you know the work the way we're taught and the that you know, even I, you're wonderful is a judgment right i mean yeah, i we, really we, we enjoy, i really enjoyed that don't we the, yeah um, exactly the, yeah. the impact of saying things like that was great and actually yeah. a three-year-old not knowing what you're talking about <laughs> you know yeah um, yeah <laughs> you know. yeah and also um, knowing that you that was great it puts you on a pedestal which you can only yeah. fall off basically. Yes, exactly. Whereas I loved that note, really touched me, that that way you yeah. played that phrase, that really touched me. That's a yeah. different, that's a very different comment. And um, I mean, it's, base, it's basic psychology, really. And as you say, I think the parenting world is probably teaching, certainly taught me a lot, and I'm still learning, I'm still r oh, rubbish at oh, it, of course. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's interesting. But what's interesting about what you just said, that note really touched me, is that's a comment that you can make and it's about what you think about it and over right. that. And it, it, it brings the, it, it stops the comment being too big. Because ultimately, yeah. I think this is the problem that I think exists in situations where dominant personalities as teachers or music directors or, or mm. whatever role they fulfil have too much um, power over how people feel about themselves by making comments like, I, I knew a music teacher once um, who used to make comments about his students that they just weren't very musical and it just used to make mm. me feel sick because I was just like, you have just condemned their entire mm. reason yeah. for making music. You know, you could say, it would still be a bit harsh, but you would like to use your example, you could say, you know, that their playing doesn't move me or you know that <laughs> that at least would then bring the comment to only being about your opinion mm. rather than 
being a comment on on everything because we get mm. told we get told these things and they stay within our our mentality they mm. stay within our uh, uh, about ourselves you're making me think about I was I'm doing a become doing a mindfulness training at the moment one of the questions we've been asked to answer is who were our teachers and what uh what did um who were the most powerful teachers for us and why and I was just thinking about a moment with my teacher in, in America, Timothy Eddy, who in, in New York. And I think one of them, this is something that we probably wouldn't be allowed to do now, because. but uh, I came off from the stage from my final recital and he just walked up to me and he said, Ruthie, I love you. And that was it. And he gave me more in that moment because it was so heartfelt. He literally heard me. And it was so heartfelt and I, I thought he taught me more. He gave me more than, you know, he was a great teacher, so he gave me loads, but it was such a powerful moment of actually being heard. And why don't we dare to do that with our students, with each other? Why don't we dare to, you know, like you say, make it about ourselves, you know, and, and have to be in this kind of power relationships, so, which is, I think, yeah. getting a bit old hat now. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, I, I see a lot of it around with people wanting to assert their own power over situations that they don't feel comfortable in. So, um, for instance, musicians who are established feeling that they need to make damning comments about other musicians so that everyone knows that they know better. There's probably a more balanced way mm. of saying that than I just did. But I, it really gets my goat when I see it, because I think you're just making your own opinion comment in such a way as it, it implies that everyone else needs to know that your opinion is really important and therefore you know that that's been said now you know that's mm. that's the view um but no i mean obviously uh, i think that there is a huge movement and i mean interested to hear as you're really in it that you do as well to, um, mm. to people being far more considerate in how they deal with um, with students and with learning and with feedback and, and all of that. Um, it's a very, very positive step, I think. Um, would you like to tell me more about Inside Out Musician, which sounds like yeah. um, a fascinating project. This involves quite a few people, right? Yes, yes. It was, uh, well, my oldest friend, Sophie Renshaw, who's a wonderful violist. She and I have been best friends since the age of 11. Um, Lucy Russell, who's the violinist in the Fitzwilliam Quartet, and uh, Liz Stillnot Johnson, who's a wonderful composer, and um, Mari Campbell, who's this really absolutely fantastic folk singing, beautiful voice and doing really interesting work. So Mari, for example, works with Interplay. And I th our idea at the beginning of Locked. Well, it was before it was before lockdown. We wanted to start doing this, and then, of course, it became apparent that it would have to be an online thing. Um, was to, I suppose, it is our call. To, it's our response to um, this question of diversity and equality that is very up at the moment. But we were really looking for a a a, a very holistic approach, um, and be something just to find some playfulness and curiosity again in in learning so Liz for example does um really fun improvisation workshops and and I'm convinced that it's really possible to to have a sense of improvisation even when we're playing playing with a score I absolutely feel we can be in that mindset and I think it, doing something like that is is really helpful. Um, Sophie works with um, basically improvising over chord sequences. If you take a sequence of Bach, for example, which I also work in the same way, we're, I suppose we're trying to unpack the way we've been taught and look at it through a really different window. The, I think the thing that, that we all share is is a commitment to the um, the fact that music belongs to everybody and that it has become so elitist and we 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 feel deeply committed to making a community of people who just all at any level from any culture so we have this 
we, we, we run this thing, a monthly Kaylee, which is an online gathering, which hopefully one day will be live, where we have, what did we have one week? So, um, an Indian cellist, folk singers, a Provencal accordion player, um, somebody doing vocal improvisation. We, it's just a, it's just a rattle bag really. And, and bringing together the, 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 the pandemic has really helped bring together a kind of global community. And it, I think it really has broken down a lot of barriers actually between different kinds of music, cross genre and, and I think there's a lot that's opened up. I really, I really hope we can uh, ride on that because I think it's a very interesting alternative to and complement to the traditional music education. I mean, we're all proper musicians. You know, we've all had 30, <laughs> 40 year careers and we're still looking for an alternative. We still feel that the, the traditional way of teaching in the traditional environment just isn't working. And so we're, we're very excited about creating a different, uh, an alternative view. And we'll see how that goes with as, as live teaching comes back. And yeah, I was going to so. ask what, what's your, you know, do you have an idea of what that will look like in a, in the hopeful world? Yeah. Of teaching I, tours where like people can get together again. Yeah. I think that what, as you said about the yoga class. I think that uh, it, online teaching isn't going away. I think it has great value. I mean, just to give you an example, you you know, I can study with my yoga teacher in Brighton, but and I'm in the south of France, and he's the one I want to study with, and I can. So, I think that that there is something's opened up which which isn't going to close down again. I think there'll be a period, absolutely rightly so, when people won't, won't want to go near Zoom. <laughs> and that's yeah. quite fine but I think we will find a balance again and certainly on Inside Out Musician we're very committed to finding the balance between live events with we, we definitely want to put on live courses definitely and and creative and collaborations and and the online I think one really feeds the other actually yeah, yeah. I was going to say actually because I wonder if when I'm thinking about how I have um, struggled to get to in-person yoga classes because of all the hang-ups I have about them, um, yeah. how somebody who's never really been involved with music before might find it easier to go to an online yeah. thing and yes, might definitely. end up, or, you know, might end up on a, in a, yeah. in a an in-person course or might not, but Absolutely. it's so much more inclusive in terms of being, it, it's just, this, it takes away all those challenges. What do you wear? How do you get there? Yeah. What if I don't meet anyone that really gets me? You know, all of yeah. that kind of thing. It just, yeah. all you do is rock up on a screen and if you, you know, there are pros and cons to this, but if you don't, want to talk to anyone you don't have to <laughs> yeah yeah i think um, it's a, it gives a certain level of safety and and i i have to say that i've i've been astonished at the level of warmth and connection that we've managed to get in the groups that i've been running mm. it's been quite quite moving actually and and i think that people will want to do that live but they'll want to keep the connection going so i really do see a future where one and both things can coexist and support each other and keep that because nobody can go you know you can't go to Provence for a gourmet you know wine tasting <laughs> you silent music yoga retreat every week can you but you can you, <laughs> but you know imagine you can go once a year or once every few years but keep all the connections going keep the community going keep the connection with the teacher with your peers it's it's a fantastic balance if we can find it i think it's very exciting actually yeah absolutely i agree it sounds very exciting um and you have been um writing articles for classical music magazine i believe inside that yeah region. yeah we're we've got a series of uh, we've been asked to do a series of 12 articles uh one a month so three of us have taken on board the responsibility of doing that. Um, Lucy, our violinist, is also doing the same mindfulness teaching training program as I am with Tara Brach and Jack Cornfield. So that's really exciting. So that we're going quite in quite similar directions, and that's also a very big part of our of our approach at Inside Out Musician. It's it, we, whoever it is, we all are committed to being very mindful. I think and. Um, 
So Lucy's done a lovely article on uh, um, going on autopilot, which was her last. And so, uh, yeah, so it's going on. It's really, it's really nice. I love writing. I actually was selected for a, as a finalist for the Guardian Women's Memoir Award. So that's my claim to fame. So it's, writing is my other, writing is one of my other passions. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I've yeah. just read the article that will have come out shortly before this um, this podcast episode does, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating. So in mm. depth, and you know, this really is uh, is detailed stuff. So congratulations. Mm. Thank you. Well, we're Sophie and I are hoping it's it's you know, sort of warm up to Sophie and I will be running a course on inside out musician at the end of June, um, really geared towards musicians going back to work, not just professional musicians, but again, we all had the same feelings, Mu amateur musicians going back to their, to their, to their quartet, you know, or their, their amateur orchestra and students going back to real life studio or auditions or anything that it's a very interesting time. And I think that Sophie and I, well, we all feel, I think there's a tremendous need for support like there was in the beginning when everybody was out of the loop. I think it's a, a time when we feel quite strongly that we'd like to give support to people who are moving back into the profession and there, there's bound to be a lot of stuff around as well as it being really exciting and I'm sure there'll be a great deal of joy, but I think there'll be other things too. And yeah, I think I... we'd like to offer a hand. And um, so we're gonna do a three day, I think it'll be something like two hours a day for three days for all musicians really to come and share with our, each other as well and with us what they're feeling about it. And then we'll be offering various tools to, to draw upon hopefully in that transition between you know, shut down and open up. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important because I think the need for support was more, probably more widely felt when we were coming out of, of normal life because, you know, yeah. everyone was reeling. But now, because we've done it for so long, it's like, oh, we'll just get back to, you know, normal in inverted commas. But, um, but actually, that is, as you rightly point out, um, is well first of all it's not normal anymore and second of all we've all changed as people and um yeah the industry has changed as well so there must be a huge amount and i'm really really glad that you're providing support for people who are um who are going through that tell us about Great. the course then is it going to be online is it going to be in person yeah the course the course will be online yeah yeah so um it's um, funnily enough it means more people can come obviously yes exactly yes. <laughs> And oh yeah, we're looking for a name. So yes. this we've been thinking about, we've been thinking about this. And I was I was reflecting the other day two um, online things that I I admire. One is Dana Fontenot's Wholehearted Musician, and the other one is Noah Kagayama's Bulletproof Musician. And I was thinking that's such a sort of perfect wow. example of the male and the female, you know. And of bulletproof course, musician. the bulletproof music. He's great. I don't know whether you know Noah Kagayama. He teaches at Juilliard. He's great. And he does loads of stuff on mindfulness as well. But it's a pretty intense title, don't you think? Yeah. And so uh, Visions of the Terminator. Yeah, with like, exactly. With you know, a clarinet or something. You know? Exactly. And we're sort of having a laugh about, I mean, you know, part of me wants to call it, you know, go back to work boot camp. And, mm. and, and then there's the other part of me that wants to call it you know the touchy-feely how do you feel get in touch with your fear uh, breathe through it you know it's it's a very interesting area and of course it um it uh i think a lot of just to give you an example i think there are a lot of men out there who 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 are going to need that a lot of support actually because i think it's it's been pretty tough in terms of um uh pride and and also and when i say men of course that's a generalization but there is a kind let's say more the male aspect if you like um the and that won't come to something if it's called you know if you talk about the heart or the spirit or or mindfulness even and so it's a quite an interesting area isn't it what do we need I'm, I'm kind of curious about that right now what what would we call what what 
people need right now. And actually, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask your listeners if they fancied coming up with a title for us, or just just throwing some words at us about what they would, what they would look for, what they feel they need. I'm very interested in 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 what's out there right now, yeah. what, what the people's needs are, and what they would go to, obviously. So titles, please, on a postcard. Yes. So where, where can they send them? Because this is actually a, a genuine, this is a request. So please do, if you're listening, so, um, get in touch with Ruth. Where should we get? Um, oh, yes, here we have the, right, uh, yeah. the email address, mm-hmm. ruth at insideoutmusician.com. Mm-hmm. You can email her. Maybe, I mean, you know, do you feel like you need the... The kick up the bum, the boot camp, right. the, the armor, <laughs> or do you feel like you need, you know, perhaps like a nice flotation tank and several massages? <laughs> <laughs> perhaps a retreat in the south of France with some wine. <laughs> um, but I do think it's really interesting, and actually, this has been um, really clear throughout, um, especially the earlier parts of lockdown, that you know, you kind of got the people who were like, Oh, it's absolutely fine. I'm, so today I learned Japanese and tomorrow I'm mm. going to be learning to bake, you know, souffles. And then, you know, and then you got the people who just didn't want to come out from underneath the duvet, you know, which is, you know, more where I was, but still. Was it? Know, yeah. <laughs> it was this, all, yeah. all, all approaches are fine, but, you know, it's this kind of the need for a, um, a sense of motivation and um and well-being and making sure those things are balanced it's something we thought Mm. about a lot because obviously we started this podcast last september Mm. and we wanted to tell the positive stories of so that because we felt that there was a lot of negativity in the music industry in general especially you know that had come from the uk government and all of the your next job could be in cyber campaign that had gone Mm. on and Mm. which you know was anyway um and and you know the lack of support um financial and otherwise an understanding that musicians have experienced over this period that there was a real feeling of of um of this being the overarching um mood and Mm. obviously there's also a lot of personal grief and loss and and other things going on so we wanted to tell i was hearing stories of people doing incredible things and I wanted to celebrate those and I wanted people to know that there were things that were they feeling up to it and were they in the place to do it that they could do and that it wasn't all doom and gloom and we did a lot of thinking about how to mm. how to put that out there in a way that wasn't like and you could learn Hungarian yeah uh, <laughs> yeah no I, I remember seeing I remember really feeling very grateful that you talked about grief I think it was really important and I don't think it was talked about enough and I should say that Actually, before the pandemic, I, um, in terms of uh, my professional life, I went through a great deal of grief. I left an orchestra that was very dear to me. It was a very, very difficult process. It was a big grieving process. Um, and I think that I, so in a, in a sense, I didn't have that profession to lose. And that made me very open to looking at alternatives and, and, and I had a lot of creative energy, but I have to say that I had that creative energy because I had gone through a great deal of grieving. Yeah. And I think that a lot of musicians, um, a lot of musicians really did go through tremendous, tr- tremendous amount of grief in this period. And, um, and I was very grateful to not be in that place. But I, that I had been previously, you know. Yeah, I mean, I felt the same actually because I've also been through um, long grief periods, and main one being that my mum died when my son was a baby, and um, I think I recognised it because I'd been through it before. If you see what I mean, so I yeah. could see that this is, and also because I'd done some exploring of grief and some exploring of. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I was going to say exploring of everyday grief. Now, I wouldn't have said that what people were going through with the pandemic was everyday grief exactly, but it is, it, it's sort of almost communal grief, isn't it? And it can be yeah. hard to balance how we I remember having lots of conversations with friends towards the beginning of, in which I would go, well, obviously I've got it loads better than some people, but mm. I am just really struggling with this. And, we, you know, we were all just, it was, everyone was the same. We all had different um, sort of pressure points and, um, you know, things that were harder than others and so on. So um, I think, well, I think yeah. also cult- culturally there, I, I, this whole idea of it going back to how it was, is not going to happen. 
I mean, I know that they're on, you know, governmentally and everything, it's a disaster and the cuts and everything, that's one side of it. But also, I don't think we should go back to how it was. I think that we need to break down barriers. I think we, and I think there, there was a kind of cultural grieving that there still is going on about the music profession. And just, it was untenable. And I don't, I'm, I think that more and more people should be playing music and there should be more and more music in schools. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be supporting, I'm saying the opposite. But the, 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 um, the barriers and the, the form that the music profession was taking, I think had, ha has had its day and it has to change. Mm. And I think there's been a level of grief that we've pos possibly, many of us have been feeling is that life as a musician, as we have known it, is no longer going to be. And I think that's good. Actually, I, I think that just like in breaking down any barriers, it's painful. And it demands something of us. It demands that we're more creative. It demands that we're more, more compassionate. Um, and if we're up to the task, then I think that it's quite possible that there will be a, a much more inclusive and much wider spectrum of what it means to be a musician. And I think that's really important that, you know, that, that we question that. What is you know, we are all, when I, my son's from uh, Mali, West Africa, from Bamako, he was adopted at the age of six months. And, you know, I remember going to Bamako and on every single street corner, people were dancing and drumming and singing. Everybody, everybody was doing it. And of course you think they're all musicians. Why do we, why have we decided that some people are musicians and some people aren't musicians? And so I think, out of this chaos something new, new hopefully will emerge I really hope so I mean of course we're talking about the you know on every level but <laughs> yeah. I'm, I suppose I'm an optimist <laughs> well I, I share your your optimism I, I hope that's the case and actually to um, again say that you know about starting this podcast in the middle of the pandemic the um, the thought of criticizing the music industry prior to the pandemic had been I mean I was aware of all of the problems with it um rather acutely aware of them but there's this sort of not upsetting the apple cart fear of um I mean no one wants to speak out against the industry that they're within and I don't think I really do that I think I speak for the industry because we all want it to be better and to work for the people that are in it but there are enormous enormous issues that are coming out and the longer I the more I speak to more people the more these issues both seem wider to spread, but also actually to be more fundamentally yeah. about a misunderstanding of what's important about making music. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and also what's important about funding it and making sure it can yeah. happen and teaching people and, about it. And, so and what we can all, what we can all learn from each other, you know, I mean, I have to say that when I remember a year in Dartington, I was teaching at Dartington school and summer school. And I remember getting up every morning to do African drumming. Right. And I did the best cello practice, practice. I was practicing in Bach suite at the time. I did the best practice I've ever done. Why aren't we learning? Why aren't African drummers and string players working together? Why have we put everybody in tiny little boxes and I'm only allowed to play Mozart and you're only allowed to bang a drum? I mean, it's just not what music is about. So that's why, that's why you know, on Inside Out Musician, we're really committed to, to doing everything we can to to bring back this this yeah uh, it's really it's it's got quite extreme i think so yeah well good for you for speaking up on your podcast uh, <laughs> well, <I don't> <laughs> who knew <laughs> I don't, we, we all turned into podcast fanatics here <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has just been such a fascinating conversation. I just want to um, to round it off and make sure that um, that all the things you've talked about, people can find. So we've got insideoutmusician.com. Um, we've got the Breathing Bow, um, which I can't remember the website at the moment, but it'll be... Thebreathingbow.com. Oh, yeah, breathingbow.com, wonderful. Um, and do check out the articles in Classical Music Magazine and, and look out for your course. And do send in... Um, names oh yeah for the, for the that'd be great <laughs> so um ruth thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and expertise oh. in this area that affects it's been lovely so to talk to you katie it's been lovely to talk to you as well mm -hmm. 
Um, and it, I feel there's, there's relatively little conventional thinking um, providing the kind of support that you offer that can help with this. Um, I think I can safely say that the watchwords for today's episode are self-care and compassion. Mm. We're yeah. all trained in how to exercise control and you've dared to talk about the importance of being willing to let go. Um, I know that our listeners will be fascinated to read your upcoming article, uh, Don't, in brackets, sit up straight, <laughs> how to move through your fears and back into the world of performance by listening to your spine, which will be appearing in Classical Music magazine. So listeners, if you're interested in Ruth's work with Inside Out Musician and The Breathing Bow, you can find these at insideoutmusician.com and thebreathingbow.com. And if you have a title idea for Ruth's online challenge, please email her at ruth at insideoutmusician.com. Thank you so much for joining Music Works. I'm Katie Beardsworth, and it's been my pleasure to share this episode with you today. Thank you so much, Ruth. Thank you, Katie. Lovely to be here. Keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Alliance Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Alliance Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.